This episode of The Sweaty Penguin is brought to you by Friendship Bracelets. Do you want to make one friend feel great and alienate your other friends? Try a friendship bracelet today. Am I going to jinx it? I don't want to jinx it. Ah, it's been a really quiet Atlantic hurricane season so far, hasn't it? Good Wednesday morning. I'm Ethan Brown, and this is Tip of the Iceberg, where I will break down some environmental news and then answer a question from our listeners on the air. Submit questions via Patreon, email, or social media. Patron questions go to the front of the line, so sign up at patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. If we look at the last month and a half, it's actually been a historically quiet hurricane season. I mean, it's so quiet, its teacher knocked it down a letter grade due to lack of participation. The 49-day period between July 3rd and August 21st, which is when I'm recording, marks the third longest gap between named storms since 1995. Second place is a 59-day streak from June 2nd to July 31st in 2007, and first place is a 61-day streak from June 18th to August 18th in 1999. Now, I was born on June 20th, 1999, so I'm not trying to say I'm the solution to hurricanes, but, I mean, you do the math. So is climate change a hoax, then? Yeah, I think that's safe to say. I just made 145 podcast episodes and got an environmental analysis and policy degree for nothing, so that's fun. In all seriousness, no. Climate change plays a factor in making individual hurricanes more severe, but it doesn't conjure them. Only Albus Dumbledore in Order of the Phoenix can do that. So let's go over how hurricanes work real quick, and then discuss why this year has been so slow so far, and what to make of it. Hurricanes form over warm ocean water in the tropics. The air above the water warms up, rises into the atmosphere, and as such, starts to form an area of low pressure. Now, contrary to my For You feed on TikTok, Earth is a sphere. And as I'm sure you know, Earth rotates. It's playing the most intense game of pin the tail on the donkey in history. So picture how this looks on a globe. If you're on the equator, one day or one rotation of the Earth means you have to go a really long distance. But if you put your finger on, say, Minnesota and rotate your globe... That rotation is a much shorter distance, since it's closer to the top of the sphere. If you put your finger on the North Pole and rotate the globe, your finger won't move at all. So what that means is people and stuff on the equator are actually moving through space faster than stuff up north and stuff down south. Now, let's say an area of low pressure forms in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Florida. I'm guessing the air above the water there is just trying to get as far from Florida as possible. But I'm a cloud by the equator. Where am I going to go? Well, I'm going to go north, into the area of low pressure. But because I, at the equator, am moving faster than the low pressure system by Florida... I'm going to end up overshooting it. My momentum is going to swing me in front of the low-pressure system. And if I'm a cloud north of the low-pressure system, I'm going to want to go south 
into the area of low pressure. But because I am moving slower than the low pressure system by Florida, I'm going to end up undershooting it. And I'll actually swing behind the low pressure system. So we've got clouds swinging in front from the south, clouds swinging behind from the north, and now they're swirling together, creating those counterclockwise rotating winds that make Al Roker start freaking out on the news. So climate change doesn't really cause any of that to happen, but it does contribute in three ways. One, hurricanes are fueled by warm air and warm ocean temperatures. You might remember from high school physics class that heat is energy. You also might remember from high school PE class that lighting yourself on fire didn't really help you play dodgeball and you ended up in the hospital, but I guess we'll trust the physicists anyway. So by making air and ocean temperatures warmer, Climate change can add energy to hurricanes and make the winds more intense. Two, warmer air also allows more water to evaporate, ultimately leading to hurricanes with more rainfall. And three, by driving sea level rise, the oceans are now closer to our communities, meaning hurricanes can travel further inland than before. They might even make it to a Cracker Barrel. So these three things all add fuel to the fire when a hurricane forms, but they don't cause that original low pressure system that gets the storm going. Now that we've got that out of the way, why have we been on this awesome storm-free streak this year, beyond the obvious fact that hurricanes are just great at Duolingo? Well, first off, we actually haven't reached peak hurricane season yet. The average number of named storms at this time of year would only be four, and right now, we have had three. The difference was that these storms were weaker than average and earlier than average, but the season as a whole is not necessarily unusual, just the last seven weeks. Peak hurricane season, though, is late August into October. Think of hurricanes the way you think of sales of pencil cases and composition notebooks. You'd think more would happen during the summer, but most happen right when the school year starts and half the students get reamed out by the teacher on day one for not coming to class prepared. We are just at the beginning of hurricane season, and while I hope our streak continues, there is a strong likelihood that things pick up in the coming weeks. I hope it doesn't, but I'm just presenting the facts here. Just one bad storm could change our entire perception of 2022. The two years I mentioned earlier with really long streaks, 1999 and 2007, both turned out to be average seasons in the end. The other interesting factor is a weather phenomenon called the Saharan air layer. So in May, June, and July, we see winds kick up a large amount of dust from the Sahara Desert in Africa and push it into the Atlantic Ocean. Now, desert air is very warm and dry, as compared to ocean air, which is very moist. That word was moist, if you didn't catch it. There's a lot of moisture in the air. Wow, I lost half our listeners just like that. But what does that mean? The dust-filled Saharan air rises over the ocean air and as such, is able to travel really far distances. It can travel further than a Spirit Airlines airplane. In fact, a portion of that air actually travels all the way to the Caribbean, Florida, and even up into the eastern Gulf of Mexico. As far as hurricanes go, this Saharan air layer does a few things. One, the dry air can travel down into the moist air of the hurricane and weaken it. It's like adding a cup of sugar to a Jim Bro's protein shake. 
two, the winds in the Saharan air layer can prevent hurricane winds from even forming in the first place. Remember what we discussed earlier, it takes a lot of very specific conditions to create those hurricane winds, and the Saharan air layer can disrupt that. And three, some research suggests that the dust in this air can actually affect cloud formation. In other words, the Saharan air layer keeps hurricanes at bay, and with that knowledge, it's no surprise that in the year 2022, according to meteorologist Rebecca Berry, we have seen a lot more dust a lot later into the summer than usual. Not breaking any records or anything, but certainly a bit of an anomaly. I'm sure you're now wondering, how does climate change affect the Saharan air layer? Is it more dust? Is it less dust? Does the dust catch on fire? Does the dust turn green and start shooting at people? Does the dust rain down on you every time you throw a paper bag in the trash instead of the recycling? In all seriousness, there's actually not a lot of research on this. Some studies have suggested it brings more dust, some have suggested it brings less dust, and ultimately it will take a lot more work from scientists to answer that question. It's definitely a pressing question, though. Obviously, given its effect on hurricanes, communities might find some future dust projections useful. Plus, I would find it useful, because then I could do a podcast episode called Dust Math! Two negatives make a positive, right? Dust Math, lesson one. And on the flip side, while the dust does help with hurricanes, it can also exacerbate respiratory illnesses. So it really is a pick-your-poison type of situation. As climate communicators, it can be easy to fall into a trap of staying quiet on an issue until it throws yourself in your face, and then we go, oh look everyone, it's climate change. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to even invite that criticism onto myself. So when we hit the third longest streak of days with zero named storms in the last quarter century, yeah, we're gonna talk about it. We're going to discuss why it doesn't negate climate change. And at least for me, I really appreciate the fact that we can talk about hurricanes and understand the pressing concerns while celebrating the good news that we haven't seen any bad ones this year. We shouldn't need disasters to cover hurricanes in the news, discuss them, and make policy around them. We are smart enough to look at the science and do all those things anyway. Well, unless we light ourselves on fire to play dodgeball, but that was just a miscommunication. Do you have one friend who you want to make feel really special? Then friendship bracelets are for you. Whether it's two cute charms that say best and friends, or matching lockets with each other's hair in it, friendship bracelets have what you need to elevate one friend to the next level. As long as you don't mind making other friends feel a little awkward when they realize there's a much stronger bond within the group. Friendship bracelets, to bring out that green-eyed monster we call jealousy. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Welcome back to Tip of the Iceberg, so normally this would be our Ask Me Anything segment, and by the way, if you have any environmental questions, any questions about the news, do send them in. You can hit us up on Patreon, social media, you can email me at ethan at thesweatypenguin.com, you can go to our website, you can stalk my personal Facebook, anything you want, send them in. We're running low on questions right now, so definitely now is a great time to submit. I'm going to hijack Ask Me Anything this week, though, to do a couple of factual corrections. 
Now, these don't happen a lot. We have multiple team members reviewing every single script and making sure all the facts look good, but we're human, and very occasionally something falls through the cracks. The two things I'm going to bring up now are pretty small details, but facts are really important to me, so I want to be sure you all are getting 100% accurate information from us. Number one, in our bees episode, we talked about Varroa mites. Varroa mites are a pest that infests bee colonies and can lead them to collapse. In the episode, I had said that Varroa mites feed on the blood of immature honeybees, and while feeding, spread viruses and leave the bee host immunosuppressed. Scientists had actually assumed this to be true for decades, but in 2019, research in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences found that Varroa mites actually feed on a honey bee organ called the fat body. The fat body serves many of the functions that the liver serves for humans, and it also stores food and contributes to bees' immune systems. Why does this matter? Because the fat body breaks down toxins. And if you remember back, another issue facing bees is pesticides. If bees lose fat body tissue, they lose some of their ability to break down these toxins, which can make the impacts of pesticides a bit worse. And fat bodies are obviously important for many other reasons too, but this is a relevant link between the varroa mite issue and the pesticide issue. So even though that was a small distinction, I'm really glad we caught it and I could share it with you. Number two, in our tip of the iceberg from two weeks ago about the Inflation Reduction Act, I had noted that in 2021, climate tech startups raised $70 billion in money from venture capital firms. Now, I researched this episode, I research and write all the Tip of the Iceberg episodes, and I swear to you, when this got flagged, I could distinctly remember reading an article with this number. I also remembered a colleague tweeting the number, and I had found an article to verify it before putting it in the script. But I saw the number flagged, I tried to find the original article, an original tweet, and I couldn't find any of it. So, yeah, that's... Very strange. But I did find an article from Bloomberg, which said in 2021, climate tech startups raised $53.7 billion from venture capital and private equity. So still a lot of money, still more money in a year than the Inflation Reduction Act is investing in climate change, which was really my point in bringing the number up. So I don't think any of my arguments in that episode change, I just wanted to be sure you had the right number. And that's it! And by the way, if you ever catch a factual inaccuracy on the show, again, we work really hard to minimize them, but it does happen occasionally, let me know. I hope not to have to do these corrections, but I'll certainly do them if and when they come up. I'm more than happy to. And with that, thanks to all of you who listen to Tip of the Iceberg. Take two minutes, help out the show, and get a shout out at the end of the show by leaving a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Podcast Addict, or join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin. You get merch, bonus content, and your questions move to the front of the line for Tip of the Iceberg. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host and guests. They do not necessarily reflect the opinions or views of Peril and Promise or the WNET Group. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you on Friday for a deep dive on our third carbon bomb. We are heading over to northern Mozambique for a really interesting conversation about the Rovuma Basin. 
and I'll tell you, the Guardian spotlighted this project specifically in the article they wrote about their investigation on carbon bombs, and I can see why. It was really eye-opening. So I hope you'll tune in on Friday for a very important episode.